Okay, so welcome and, and thank you very much, Carleen and Nat, for, for joining joining me today uh, yeah. for another episode of Talking Therapy. My name is Dev Raj and um, as usual, I'd just like to start off by asking guests to introduce themselves and and really just just say a little bit how you came to become a therapist, you know, in your own in your own words. Was it your vision from childhood or perhaps not? Uh, yeah. So whoever would like to go first, just just jump in. Yeah. <laughs> how about you, Carly? OK, I'll start. Um, I didn't know about therapy when I was a child. Um, I think if I had known, I would have known that that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't know. Uh, and when I was sort of 23 and I finished my courses and trainings and school, there was really that sense of, oh, there must be more to life than this. I, I grew up in the Netherlands, um, in, a, you know, in the north of the Netherlands. And um, at that time, there was just not much therapy around or not that I knew of. I, did, I didn't know. And then by, by pure coincidence, somebody asked me whether I wanted to be um, a babysitter, somewhere, something to do with psychology, somewhere in France. And that happened to be babysitting Gerda Boysen's grandchild. So I went and I lived with the Boysen family for a bit. And I, from the moment I arrived, I thought, yeah, this is it. This is what I was looking for. And it was a chateau where they did their um, the summer residentials for the trainings in the whole of Europe. So I saw a lot of the work going on around me and I was allowed to join some groups and I traveled around with them and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And Gerda was in London. So that's, I first trained a little bit in Amsterdam, but then I thought, no, I really want to learn this. And then I came to London in 1985. Oh, well, 80, it was end of 84, uh, yeah and joined the training then, and that's where I met Anat. Mm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You guys go back a long way. We go back a long way, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, when, um, I, when I was a child, I, I was um, very fascinated uh, by the natural world and medicine and, um, and uh, arts, mainly dancing. I grew up in a place that was, uh, I grew up in a kibbutz in Israel. Um, so it was um, really like a beautiful village in nature. And um, as I was growing up, I was more and more involved in the arts. And um, then I came to a crossroads in my life when I was in Covent Garden and, um, I wasn't sure I wanted to pursue any more the performing art world, the, the dance world. I wanted something more to do as well with healing and medicine. But I did not want to be a doctor. That was not something that attracted me as I learned more about the actual practice mm -hmm. of medicine. And uh, then suddenly somebody called my name in Covent Garden as I was sipping my coffee. And it was an old friend. And uh, she told me about the Gerda Boysen Center. And so I made some contact and I arrived there. And the moment I opened the door to the, um, to the school, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do because it was that marriage between the, the arts meaning the creative element of being alive, being healthy, and as well of medicine, of the natural sciences. And for me, it was an amazing uh, integration. And um, as well, the spirit of the work, without knowing really much about it, was everywhere. So I just knew that I wanted to to, to do this, whatever this was. And uh, shortly thereafter, I met Carlene. Yeah. <laughs> that way. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Y
way. So, yeah. and um, I didn't think about being a therapist even at that point. It wasn't that word wasn't what was important. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was that creating from within in the arts, especially in performing arts, is a lot from inside out in a way. But in this form of therapy, there is every every session is a creation all by itself, and there is a, one main person, and that's the client, or in teaching, it's the students, and so it's a it's really an amazing, uh, creative wonderland. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and, oh, sorry, you wanted to add something. Well, and those were different times in the 80s, you know, like we we were both, well, we were both 25, but you were 24, probably, and that's, you know, young, yeah. And, you know, we lived in squads and we spent every day pretty much around the center. Gerda, Gerda had her own house in Acton Park, and it was all devoted to training and and you know, and then you could move into the clinic to start seeing clients, and and pretty much that was our life. And you earned a bit of money around to pay for the next course. Mm. Um, mm. You know, so very different than nowadays. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's you know wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a little bit like the kind of Osho thing, you know, back in the yeah, 70s, yeah. But, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There must have been a bit of crossover, I expect. Yes, there was a crossover. Oh, yes, uh, definitely. Gerda, Gerda knew about uh, Osho very, very much. And yeah. after he was doing a lot of, um, you know, some of Alexander Law and uh, work. And he, he was in a crossroads uh, too, um, mm. between worlds, the spiritual and the, the human yeah. development. Um, so, um, yeah, the school was beautiful. We had a big garden outside and we were just by the edge of the park and and um yeah you realize afterwards how lucky we were with having that space yeah know? yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah things kind of changed but um yeah. so, so was was Gerda running like a, a big training at that time a, yeah and she was a lot abroad as well she had a lot of groups in Germany in France um you know, Netherlands, um, Switzerland. So she, she traveled a lot as well. So she, but, you know, this, the school went through different phases. When we arrived, there had just been a split off. Um, I don't know if you heard of the Chiron Center. The, uh, the Chiron Center, that was a uh, big yeah, school. Heard of it, yeah. yeah. So she, they, they, they were with Gerda Boysen, okay. Bernd and Jochen and Reinhard. So they, they trained with Gerda Boysen. They were trainers in the school. And then there was a split. So they had just split off and started a, this school in Ealing, mm -hmm. um, which then sort of forced Gerda to come back more in and teach in London, um, which was sort of to our advantage because we got much more from Gerda, of Gerda's teaching than the, the people before us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where, where did she learn then? Did she learn from, from Reich or was she like, a, what, what, what was her background, Goethe's background? She did not learn from Reich directly. Uh, mm. She actually studied, uh, she is from uh, Norway and she studied uh, psychology, so she was a psychologist. And then she went to work uh, with Adele Bilo Hansen and Professor Bartoy in the mental health uh, services in uh, Oslo mm -hmm. and there she learned the a physiotherapy technique that was created by Adel Bilo Hansen mm -hmm. and was working uh, deeply into the muscular contractions to bring an emotional expression mm -hmm. um, and that's that's where a lot of things started to happen but just to answer your question so that was what was happening on the professional side and on her private therapy side she actually worked with the the number one uh, student of Reich in Norway mm -hmm. uh, which was hmm? did you say something Kelly? no Reich, Reich was in Norway for a few years yeah. before he went to uh, America yeah. 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 But then he had yeah. a student uh, that he um, 
Um, just remind me of his name. Ola Rackness. Ola Rackness. Ola Rackness. And when uh, Ola Rackness wanted to study from Reich, uh, Reich said to him, no, you can't study. You're 50. You're too old. No. Uh, you can't, nothing is going to happen to you anymore. And um, and then uh, he insisted. And I'm saying that because I think sometimes people, even when they come to the training or people in life, when they reach a certain age, they think that that's it. Life is over and I'm counting my days to the coffin or something like that. Yeah. Uh, where So he was 50. Uh, and Reich thought about that, you know, like, no, it's over for you. And he insisted and he became one of his most uh, loyal students. He went to Maine when he was in the United States, right? So he was Gerda's therapist. Mm -hmm. And so through, through, um, through working with Reichian methods and mainly vegetal therapy, which is to allow the movement of the unconscious through the body, we could say um, that's how she learned about Reichian therapy without any theory. Mm -hmm. And then she started with Ola Rackness what she was finding out working in the mental hospital. And, um, and then he gave her uh, to read some of Reich's uh, material. And so she was in a way being trained experientially without knowing about it uh, in such a way. Yeah. And, and uh, she, she also, so she was a psychologist and she also trained as, um, as a physiotherapist before she went to Adel Bülow Hansen. And I think Bratoy uh, uh, was also a student of Reich at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. And Ola Rackness had a, a clinic in London and mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this was already, I think, after she finished therapy with him and she, she met him somewhere in the street and, and she was thinking of moving to England. And he said, well, I'm thinking of stopping my, uh, my clinic, but maybe you want to take over. So she came to London in 69, something like that, and, and took over his, his mm -hmm. uh, clinic and... Mm -hmm. And from there, she just, you know, that was, um, you know, there was so much happening in London uh, in the therapy scene. So she just, you know, found her own way more and more and more. She had already discovered something that's quite central to her, which is psychoperistalsis. Um, we can talk more about it in, in, um, in Oslo, but she, you know, she just kept developing her own, mm -hmm. her own way and her own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the first time I heard of um, uh, Gerda was from uh, Viresh, Denis Sanchez, who was the head of the university, uh, mm. passed away about five, six years ago. And I remember him talking about 15, 20 years ago about, because he was in London for quite a while after he'd let, well, I think Phoenix House, this drug treatment center, therapeutic community thing out of New York, had mm -hmm. relocated to London, or they'd, they'd started a branch in London and they wanted him as a graduate of their school, ex-drug user in, in, in New York to come over and run it. And then he was kind of hanging out in the 70s in the kind of hip and cool scene of, of London at the time. And he ended up doing sessions with Gerda Boyson. And, mm -hmm. and, she, and, and what he remembered was, I think he said something like, he'd go every week and he'd have to lie on this kind of, you know, massage table mm -hmm. and Gerda would kind of prod him and make him make sounds and things like this. And at some point, his body, one day, his body just started to kind of do this, this movement of itself, you know, like yeah. a simultaneous thing. And he was like, what the hell's going on? You know, and, yeah. and he said, well, now you've got it. You've got the orgasm reflex or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I first heard about her from. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, is it, it, it is what, what I'm describing similar to what you guys are practicing now or, or, or teaching? Or has there been changes or evolution or, or anything like that? You go. You can go first, Anna. Well, I would say there is. We are working uh, very similarly because the methods that uh, Gerda developed, and as well the methods that we took from other um, 
modalities, body psychotherapy modalities, such as bioenergetics, such as uh, the Reichian work, are very uh, well integrated in the work. Uh, they are very uh, effective. And uh, because, you know, a human is a, a human being and techniques are a language for the client connect to elements of themselves. So we are working with uh, touch, we're working with, uh, for a lack of a better word, massage, but it's not massage like uh, somebody goes and receives Swedish massage just for um, to accelerate the circulation and relaxation. But we see uh, working with the body with touch as part of psychotherapy of healing the self. And um, so we are using we uh, massage techniques in a therapy room. We have a massage table to work mainly with touch. Then we have uh, two chairs where we do more what you can uh, say more the more traditional uh, level of the cognition and uh, verbal expression and so on, but in a rooted way, connected to the, the sensations connected to the breath. And we have a mattress where uh, your friend, uh, not your friend, the person that you spoke of a moment ago, um, where this work with the movement uh, of the life force, which is the what the Reich called the orgastic reflex, orgastic from organism, not necessarily directly and connected to sexuality um, uh, is happening and that is on the mattress and those are very uh, very much the room that gird ahead and we were taught to work on all those uh, different levels mm -hmm. and uh, so as such we are um, quite classical in our work but we keep on developing it with the new techniques that is coming with the new information that is coming mm -hmm. Um, as well mm -hmm. yeah and and you know and we are not Gerda of course you know Gerda was quite unique um, and Gerda kept developing herself as well the whole time but but you know at the moment the people training at the school we have all been taught by her and and not just the training we kept we kept on being taught by her mm -hmm. for many years so um yeah, I would say we, we are as much as, you know, everybody has it, their own version of it, but we are teaching her methods still, yeah. And, and that feels quite um, important that it's still biodynamic psychotherapy. It's not just general body psychotherapy. It is biodynamic. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so do you guys, when, you, when you've um, graduated from the school, you're mostly working one-to-one -one or... Do you run workshops? What's your kind of, uh, I don't know, format or, or mm -hmm. how, how does it kind of go? If someone approaches, because what's the official name of the school? Has it got London in the title or is it just like the centre for? Uh, well, it's... <laughs> it seemed a little, I wasn't quite sure. We, we are a bit confused about it. It, it was, well, it used to be the Gerda Boyson Centre where we trained and then um, UKCP wanted the training that wasn't so family uh, owned and organized um, mm -hmm. and and Gerda was getting older anyway and so then the London School for Biodynamic Psychotherapy got established in 2000, 2001 mm -hmm. um, and, and Gerda was sort of you know the inspiration but she wasn't a director or she wasn't so because that was quite a that was a requirement from UKCP to have more uh -huh. um, uh, and then, but then there's a lot of therapists who are not London based and they thought, why, why this name London School of Biodynamic Psychotherapy? Um, mm -hmm. So there, there's been a vote to call it as well, the Center for Body Psychotherapy. I think that's, is that a, a word? Yeah. So we're a bit both. Uh -huh. okay. But, but, uh, but uh, the name LSBP or London School of Body, Biodynamic Psychotherapy has not gone away. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. I'm yeah. Sure. So for people 
Training. And and what and what is what is you know what is I think quite special about the school is that we're sort of a member a member run school. Mm -hmm. so nobody owns the school. Mm -hmm. you know, the school belongs to the members, and and members step up to sit in the different committees and you know to be trainers and um, you know with its its pros and cons. You know, like uh, nobody has has the um, the ultimate say. We have to find a way as a group. Mm -hmm. to do that yeah so you have like annual meetings and stuff like yeah that. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and then you vote on different issues and yeah whatever. yeah and just going back to what i said about, about asking about the how, how do most therapists who who graduate with your school what, what do they then do basically they're working their their what, what what kind of format are they are they using working one-to-one -one with clients or Mainly, I would say, yeah. So we, we, we train people for adult psychotherapy mm -hmm. and, and mainly you work one-to-one. -one. Um, I mean, Annette and I, we teach as well and we supervise. Um, and we run uh, workshops. And we run workshops. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you, you develop, but uh, you start off becoming a UKCP registered psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you need like a prior, do you, do you need a prior training before someone, someone wanted to uh, get involved with your school? Because I mean, traditionally like the IIBA, you know, you'd, you'd have to be, uh, you would have to be qualified as a psychoanalysis, a, a psychotherapist certainly before, mm. before like you need a, at least a sort of basic qualification in clinical psychology or something like that. Mm -hmm. is, it, is that the same with your school or, or, or how does it kind of work? I can answer, but, do you want to speak? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we call it a postgraduate training. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it helps to have um, a degree, um, but it's not it's not what's most important. So you can also apply if you don't if you haven't had the degree, um, and you've been a housewife your whole life. You know, it's it it. Um, um, it really is to do with people's interest and people's willing, you know, um, there, there, you know, there are, there is, you know, there are written requirements to meet and, uh, but, you know, you can get help with that. Um, so I can just add something that. Um, like when Carlin said, a housewife, it's yeah, like, I don't mean that in, as in a sense of life experience that exactly, um, mm -hmm. Some people go and get a degree in an institute and others get a degree in life. Yeah. And so it's the life experience that uh, we are looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and a degree is, uh, is supporting, but uh, it doesn't mean that somebody has a degree that they are automatically can um, do the training. Mm -hmm. There's an interview and we're really evaluating the readiness of a person to embark on something so profound because um, a therapist, <clears throat> and especially I would speak about biodynamic psychotherapy, we are the tool. So we have to go through the process of self to transform the self and to go from our, <clears throat> what we, excuse me, <clears throat> what we call the secondary personality, which is the armored self, the protected self, the insecure self, um, to come and connect more with our healthy self, with our ability to, to expand, to allow, not to be so much in survival. And that is a transformational process that requires a lot of um, willingness to, to go through this process. So... Um, uh, it's um, that's why we have a quite rigorous interview uh, to really um, see if if the person is ready to do it first for themselves and then as well for the ones that they are going to be serving later on. Mm. So just to 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 put the yeah. housewife in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, I, I certainly didn't mean it as. Um as the rocker tree at all, you know, but it, it is, like you said, it's life experience. Um, it's often kind of struck me as a bit, you know, if you, if you look at professional qualifications, standing back a bit, you know, if you were thinking about, okay, someone wants to become like an engineer to make a bridge, 
yeah. whatever you think yeah well of course they need a pretty good brain yeah. And, yeah. and we don't want the bridge to fall down and all that kind of thing but yeah when you look at therapy and mental health you know of course having a, a highly developed intellect is not is one not necessarily so so mm -hmm. useful it may be useful it may be not it's very yeah. useful if you want to get a degree or a phd or something but it's not yeah. so useful and openness heart connection yeah is it kind of ability to walk the talk and, and, and that kind of thing are far yeah. more seems to be far more important to, to me and yeah and then you know when we look at the kind of ongoing mental health crises that we have in the west a lot of them set t tend to feed out of this but you've got this kind of you've got these kind of institutional bodies that are that, that are regulating therapy and 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 that's you know, good in a sense, because obviously you don't want unregulated people just mm. really doing that. Mm. But at the same time, it, it doesn't really work quite somewhere. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly, but like there's something that, that there's a lack of acknowledgement of like the other qualities you're talking about and that there's a lack of acknowledgement in our culture or in the kind of the hierarchy of the British Psychological Society or whatever, you know, there's, we, we haven't really come to terms with that. And uh, I don't know, when I see like, chatting to other psychotherapists in America sometimes, you know, something they're concerned about is apps taking over because there's huge background investment in, in phone apps, which can basically do psychotherapy, counseling, mm. and some of them are actually pretty interesting, to be quite mm. honest. Most therapists are immediately like, whoa, this is like, mm -hmm. like, like, like the evil coming from ever, but, but it, it, it's, it's all kind of interests me, you mm. know, and, and, and and, and where therapy has, has been good and where it has kind of failed and stuff like that, you know, it's like we're kind of, we seem to be moving into a time, particularly the, the COVID exacerbating so many symptoms, you know, like what, what really can, can, can be done in society to kind of get therapy and somehow on track to really, to really mm. deal with the kind of anxiety and depression and, and things like this that people are suffering, you know, I don't know. Yeah if we can do it or not what, what do you guys think about this kind of area you know do you have opinions about it or ideas how can therapy be improved well i, I think i think therapy is needed almost more than ever nowadays and and to have lots of different ways that people can access is 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 great um i mean i you know, for me, for example, what works is not just somebody being with me, but if somebody touches me with the right intention and attention, that is when, when something really opens up in me. Um, and an, an app wouldn't be able to do that. You know, I, I, uh, I really benefit from touch. Um, so, you know, I think there will be a place for all of it still. And human connection, I can't see. But I, I, you know, the more people can be helped, the better. And people are at different stages and people need different things. And, mm. um, you know, yeah. It's not that one is necessarily better than the other. It's just what suits you. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to add that therapy is in the context of one's life. And so the more stresses are in society and the more people feel helpless to change their own circumstances, therapy has a difficulty to counteract, to support change. Change is like a new seedling. It mm. is very strong with its life force, but it is weak physically. I mean, all the great, uh, all, um, all plants, all animals, they start very small like we do. And change is very small when it starts. And the more desperation, the less patience mm. to water and feed that and so then the hopelessness drives people to the shortest possible process to get relief mm -hmm. however change doesn't work like that 
because change has to become organic, meaning that we change to the level that we don't need to think and effort to yeah. create our change on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. that our brain, our neural net suddenly is different. That I smile instead of frown. Mm -hmm. That I breathe deeper instead of be tight and look around all the time being frightened of what's next in when I open the television mm -hmm. or listen to the news, what's next is going to happen to me. Yeah. And so I think that the, the, the self-help is very good. However, it can only help oneself within the box of their life or within the sphere of their life. And to work with another human being, it means that it's out of that. And so there is a place for everything. But the more desperation, the, the, the less time people feel they have to go through a process of change versus a process of self of of a first aid. Mm. Yeah. And 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 that is why sometimes people look at therapy and go, well, it's not helpful. And it's like, no, it is, but if you don't stay long enough, you never three you never see the tomato seedling, which is tiny produce yeah. this mass amount of tomatoes. I yesterday just went and just ate some tomatoes from a plant and I always marvel that where does it start and where is it? It's now. Mm. And so that's uh, the same in all these processes. And, um, you know, the Reich came at the time of great sexual suppression and great unhappiness. And then there were the two uh, world wars and the world has not been quiet since. So we live in, in times that um, um, almost nobody, well, nobody is left from the, um, almost nobody is left from the First World War. And from the Second World War, we have less. And so we think now it's the worst. But the worst is for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we have to see all those things in context. And, uh, and uh, the biodynamic psychotherapy works very much for a person to reconnect with, with the inner resiliency, we could say. Mm -hmm. And that takes time mm -hmm. if we spend a long time away from it. Mm -hmm. And it's not time as far as hours or years. It just takes whatever it takes. We don't know. Yeah. So um, maybe it is a long answer for short questions, but I find that normally short questions bring long answers. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when we're passionate about it. And yeah, you know, like, mm. the, the students that say, I have a short, I just have a little question. And I always yeah. go, like, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can relate in my own life because sound like both you guys got into therapy quite young through mm. the process and I didn't you know I was kind of aware that I'd had some level of severe trauma being adopted the bad family set up the adoptive family uh, multiple health crises and blah 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 uh, uh, in my infancy but until I was nearly 40 I just thought well I'll just uh, I'll deal with it later you know mm. and here's this kind of aspect of the psyche you know where almost something has to get, I don't know, it wasn't for me that it got really bad. I actually just sat down one day in a foreign park and realized that I totally wasn't happy and, and, and then elected somewhere internally to change. It wasn't a super emotional moment, even though I had a lot of suppressed emotionality inside, but there, there was just an awareness like, okay, if I'm gonna change, I'm gonna have to start soon. I'm gonna have to start mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to be willing to sacrifice some of my freedom, money, whatever, mm -hmm. in order to get involved in change. And, and then it seemed quite easy and chatting to people. Sometimes I meet people, similar people, and, and some go through like uh, some life crisis, relationship yeah. breakup, loss of a loved one or whatever that can drive them into therapy or something bad happens. Or mm. some people just seem to realize it's time. But mm. I don't know for the greater mass of humanity if they, if, if I don't know if they ever will, you know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I kind of think like, uh, like, how I see it a little bit is if you've got like a hundred people, maybe 
I don't know, it, maybe it's not, maybe 0.1% will just change. They will just do whatever it takes to change. They'll get out mm -hmm. of where they're at and they will just change. And then 99% yeah. probably won't bother. You know, they might think yeah. about it a little bit, but they probably won't bother. And then you've yeah. got about 1% in between who kind of, if they get support and if they get, they find the right connections mm -hmm. and they can kind of get that internal velocity up to escape their cultural programming and, and, and mm -hmm. create a better life for themselves. Yeah. But I don't know if we, when I was at the Human University, what really struck me coming from a background of huge low self-esteem and actually spending a lot of time surrounded by druggies, criminals, and a lot of general London street life, you know, was that it was possible for humans to really develop and be awesome creatures. Mm. You know, because a lot yeah. of the, the yeah. therapists there really, I'd never met people like this, but they, they, they were just so big energetically, you know, yeah. I've never really met people like this. And, yeah. and, and it struck me because then, I thought, well, well, God, you know, this potential is inside of all humans, you know, yeah. we never yeah. seem to realize it. And now, I don't know, we just seem to be getting more and more kind of ground down somewhere inside ourselves. I just wonder, will there ever be a time when humans can really just flower to a certain degree that it, it creates some kind of positive feedback loop? You know, I don't know. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but all I know is this is the only meaningful thing for me to to do for myself and to do for my work. Mm, yes. You know? I'm saying uh, so. Yeah. So, yeah. How the world will go, who knows? But, yeah. but this, is, this is what I, and what I do love as well is that when, a, you know, in my own life or a client and there, there is change, it affects the people around them. You know, it, it's little little ripples go mm -hmm. on and on and on and and just to start feeling life becoming colorful again or life becoming meaningful or joyful or you know it doesn't mean there's no painful things but you are back with source <laughs> you know you reconnect to source and to life force and yeah mm. yeah cool thank you mm. You know, change, change is, <clears throat> is one at a time. And, uh, and it is a personal decision. And um, like Arlene said, it's uh, these beautiful concentric rings that is one changes, or one we could say instead of using the word change, when one connects more with, with the... It's a strong word, joy. Mm. The joy of being alive. It's not about every day uh, thinking, oh, it's the best day of my life, even though it's the only day of my life. Um, it's, it's a change in approach of how I approach myself and how I approach my, the events in my life and where is my home. And the more home is within, the more we are connected to that source, that reactor that from where life is actually coming in us, which is, um, and that's a sort of a question of what is life mm -hmm. and what is it worth living for? And that's the second one is definitely a personal answer. Mm -hmm. And it's as well an education. And so if education is only for, or mainly for productivity, for survival and producing for others so I can survive, that's a very narrow wedge out of this huge unlimited sphere that life is. Mm -hmm. And if we are educated for creativity and for what else is possible for me and in me then the child curiosity versus in uh, failure and success one of the sentences that i hear so much in therapy is that really haunts people am i am i good enough is that good enough and it's like where is that book of bars that you measure up to or down to <laughs> And that haunts people and make people that um, it, it's sort of like the shackles that don't allow a person to 
to thrive and self-validate. So we are the education system is what we meet later in psychotherapy. We meet later the belief systems of the parents. We believe the society. The yes, we meet the bullying that children go through. Mm. And the more they are open to images, because images are something that goes straight into our unconscious. It's it's not we can't we can't block. It's like smell. We can't block it. Once we have it, it's there. And um, and with all the exposure to the social media that is so external to people, they start validating themselves by absolute strangers. So there is more insecurity. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do I matter? Mm -hmm. So there is really pivotal changes that are happening that um, I think... Um, psychotherapy and uh, and society or psychology and sociology they're totally linked mm -hmm. and one doesn't live out of the other and so i think uh, we don't dare necessarily to deal with social questions um, so straight on or spiritual questions because the spirit is what supports one's hardship yeah. and um and with the fall of religion, in a way, uh, religion is no longer so strong. Mm -hmm. So what are the what is the inner compass, the conscience that one lives by? Is mm -hmm. it just external or is it something internal? Yeah, that's that's sort of while you were talking, and I really feel like I want to bring that more to the fore. That um, I mean, Gerda, Gerda discovered, I mean, it not, was not just that she believed it, but she really discovered that, um, you know, there is no dogma about what you should do or how you should get to connect to the joy. You know, we are, it's, it's, it's an unfolding of yourself, you know, and the more you get out of the shackles, you know, get out of, you know, the more you can release the patterns of defense structures that you had to build for, and they, they are fantastic that you had them, you know, we're not, you know, these defenses need to be celebrated because they got you through life and to where you are at. But the more you can create a situation where it's safe enough to just let them melt, let them, you know, let them integrate. Um, something just just arises from within and Gerda talked about and that this is as well why I really like that we use touch and um, the body work is that you know that that's releasing of the patterns is not just a mental pattern it's also very much in the body tissues and the more that releases the more you get the sense of streaming Gerda called it streamings you know it's like the connective tissue, the fluids. We are, you know, more than 65% fluids, you know. Uh, the more it starts to flow again. And just that experience of energy, of fluid flow, energy flow, is joyous, it's pleasurable, you know. It feels alive. You feel, you know, energized by that. So she, she said it's, it's just, a, and, and, and that then guides you. Okay, so where do I... You know, when I'm amongst the trees, I, I can feel that sort of expansion. And when I'm in another situation, it contracts me. And, and, you know, and the more and more you listen from bottom up, you know, rather than from top down, it's, it's mm -hmm. really bottom up living. Like what, what supports my, my energy? And uh, I very much like that you know, it's not one size fits all. There is no, no plan of what you should reach. You know, it, it, you just, it is go inside and, and it will reveal itself. Yeah. Mm. I like what you said just at the beginning there. It's like almost for a lot of people just, what I find with clients is, you know, it's very common for me to deal with people who just talk about low self-esteem or need for constant mm. validation, you know. That to recognize that these this is defense essentially yeah. you know, low self-esteem is not some 
necessarily, well, it's not necessarily useful to think about it as some horrible thing that your teachers or parents or yeah. other kids put on you. It's you in defense, keeping your head yeah. down yeah. because yeah. you're yeah. safe, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, uh, people don't often, well, people don't always want to hear that, but I think it's the most useful, the useful yeah. way of, of seeing these things, you know? Yeah. It is interesting, I find, in, in, in modern culture with the development of social media, just how much people just kind of, I don't know, they just work out, what is it, one that I can say or write that kind of gets me likes and that doesn't get people to mm -hmm. give me a hard time. You know? I know, I know, I know. I know. Of, it just seems like for a lot of people, that's mo young people in particular, that, that's a yeah. lot of what they're doing, you know? Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. It, and it and it takes you away from what do I want to write? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's this constant, almost invalidation of the self at a deeper level. Yeah, really, yeah. You know, yeah. and it's being subsumed, not even to what other people want of you, but what you think other people mm -hmm. think you should, who you think other people think you should be. You know, it's yeah, yeah. It's crazy some of it, but like, yeah, it's also kind of interesting, I find. But I mean, yeah, mm. yeah. What do you guys enjoy doing as a therapist? What do you, uh, what kind of, uh, what's, what turns you on in ther about therapy and about the client or the work you do personally? Well, I enjoy the intimacy of, you know, getting to being with a person who's willing to really show themselves, you know? Um, I enjoy being able to work with my heart um, while, while keep, you know, keep clean boundaries and all of that. But I, I'm, you know, I think the biodynamic work allows me to, you know, to touch when I want to touch, to open my heart when I want to open my heart and, and, and that it all, you know, and then to see somebody slowly, you know, finding their own. Mm. Heart is is able to open as well, and and um, yeah, especially those glimpses of what you know we call it the primary personality, but those glimpses of somebody connecting to their essence yeah, beyond yeah whatever structure. I mean that that is you know exciting. Uh, that's what I really love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, uh, I love what Carlene's love, <laughs> and as well the the creative process, the the being present in the moment that all there is that moment is that person and their life and that I am a guest in their life, a privileged place. And how uh, to, to notice the different, uh, almost like the different chapters of one's life, of the client's life, how they open in a non-linear way and seeing the thread or the threads that are flowing through it and how they uh, appear in their life in different ways and to to support the flow of the river the flow of their life in the direction like Arlene said before not in a predetermined direction mm. it is predetermined possibly but meaning if, if we don't change, if we keep on doing the same, it is predetermined. It's like throwing the past forward. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it's uncharted. And mm -hmm. to, to develop with the client, for the client, in the client, in this other person, the curiosity and the wonderment about their own life. Mm -hmm and how they can see their past not as a, as, a, as a sort of events that bring them pain or just simply or joy, but actually as their own schooling, their own 
place where they can they can learn from mm-hmm. and how to then extrapolate it and to move it into into greater future so that creative process i find so fascinating and um and endearing and very um it is a place of the heart and the expansion of myself so i can mm-hmm. have in a way a very close perspective to what they're presenting now and as well as to keep my mind and myself much more expanded so I can almost I can hold a possible a possible future not in an event but as where this this can develop to so they have a place mm-hmm. to arrive to because we can't go for, we can't let go of the past we can't let go of a habit if we don't start nurturing a new one mm-hmm. and that's why when people are told let go or relax or this kind of they sound fantastic mm-hmm. but where would i relax to mm-hmm. where would i let go into so the process in in biodynamic which i love is that while we are supporting that softening of the crust, being in, encrusted in this armor, in this protection, to soften it, at the same time, we are growing something new. So as mm-hmm. one is, is letting go, the other is coming up. Just like the snake, the mm-hmm. snake doesn't just shed the skin and lies there naked. Actually, it's the movement of the new that peels off the old mm. and and to to be in that uh, creative space is amazing because um, it starts from the unseen to a really embodied manifestation so mm. it's it's really extraordinary in a very ordinary way mm. Mm. thank you it's beautiful You were mentioning something else you could talk about, Carly, in uh, peristalsis or something, was it? Yes, yes. I was thinking I would like to bring that in. Um, This was when Gerda worked in the clinic uh, with mental health patients um, and Adolf Bülohans clinic or around that time. um, She noticed that, uh, you know, clients who had sort of physiological apreactions, you know, they had either diarrhea or, you know, felt sick after treatments or something like that would, it would indicate, would somehow be connected with some kind of shift, some kind of release. Mm -hmm. Um, And then as, and then later on, she became more aware that that could be done in a much subtler way. It didn't have to become a hole throwing up or, um, but that she became more and more aware that um, when clients had tummy rumblings during her treatments, um, there would be either a shift or they would feel just lighter more afterwards. And she realized that, that these tummy rumblings are, you know, they're an indication of parasympathetic activity. So there is something is clearing, something is letting go because we don't digest when we have to be in fight and flight. Yeah? Um, so, um, and, and she became curious about it and then she found a way of listening to it. You know, she had also a period where she, you know, I'm now in a room which is on the roadside, you know, so, um, and usually I'm in the, in another room. Um, and she, so she had also saw clients for a period in a room that was quite noisy and she realized that her work wasn't quite as, as productive as it had been. And, um, and anyway, she, she came to use a stethoscope and realized there was a whole language with the psychopirus. She called it, well, actually her daughter, Mona Lisa, coined the term, um, psychopirostalsis. Mm-hmm. Um, and she started to use the different sounds, you know, because there's lots of different sounds. Um, you know, it can be more watery, it can be crackling, it can be like an old door just opening, you know or it can be a roaring lion, or it can be, you know, it, there's a whole array. Um, 
and and it's still not explained why you know that there, there is scientifically they do know there is um I think migrating motor complex, it's called, you know, that there is a movement in the guts that has not to do with pushing the food through. Mm -hmm. But that's as far as science is, as far as I know in, in understanding that. But anyway, we use it. We use a stethoscope. I, I can show you one. You know, it's, it's, um, it's quite old fashioned. <laughs> I mean, Gerda used to have them in her ears, you know, um, a non-electronic, but this is, you know, an electronic box. And then here you have the, the stethoscope and you put it on somebody's tummy or underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and we listen to the sounds all the time when we work. Wow. And, and in, in the massage and, and otherwise, you know, we always listen out for the, the sounds. So it, it is an extra tool when we touch. So a person might say, well, I feel, you know, that feels really good and I feel relaxed. And, but if, there is, if the peristalsis is locked, we know there is a layer, you know, on what we call the vegetative layer, you know, sort of the autonomic nervous system layer that hasn't really released. Yeah. So it, it is sort of like our window into the autonomic nervous system, let's say. Uh, it's a key into the autonomic nervous system. And, and Gerda became a real artist at it. Mm. You know, and she would say, um, you know, when she did a treatment, so find the key to the psychoperistalsis, you know, what is the, where is the key? And, and that once you, you are able to open it, you know that whatever treatment you do, there is a cleansing and a clearing process happening, mm -hmm. you know, which means that whatever pattern emotional pattern you're working with um, is sort of starting to diffuse which means that the body tissues become more more cleansed and cleared and so life energy can flow better through them mm -hmm. yeah. and and what i like about it i mean it's certainly it's a nice sound you know it's a sound we all heard when we were in our mother's womb because mm -hmm. people you know so it goes quite it can go quite deep Mm -hmm. um, and, and it keeps us very humble, you know, Gerda would say, you know, the queen doesn't know, the therapist doesn't know, the psychopaths, the stethoscopes know, so the psychopaths know, so it keeps us quite humble, we follow mm -hmm. something very organic that you can't will, you know, you can't will a tummy mumbling, mm -hmm. it's an autonomic nervous system response. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes us therefore very attuned. So, you know, so you touch a, a tight arm and you might think it's tight. Okay, it needs opening. We need to sort of loosen it. But if the peristalsis doesn't respond, then maybe the peristalsis responds much more when I just put my hands very gently on that arm. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm getting the sounds. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's, it's an amazing extra extra tool we have and mm -hmm. and and this was something that is really good as um, own discovery mm -hmm. and and she noticed as well like you know with big process coming up and especially again in the 70s and 80s you know a lot was about you know you we need to all scream we need to all let it out we need to all yeah, oh, yeah. um and she really was one of the first and maybe also because she was almost the only woman, you know, there was a lot of male, you mm -hmm. know, Lowen and, and Piracos and, you know. So, and she just really realized how important this is, not just the scream that's important, it's the clearing afterwards, the integration afterwards, you know, the recuperation, the rehabilitation, the body really integrating whatever has been released, that that is really important. and and. So the sacred peristalsis um, helps us to be aware of that part of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. Mm. I mean, I certainly myself went through a big journey around, uh, you know, emotional catharsis and this, this mm. kind of thing of kind of originally believing it was like a sort of salvific force that was yeah. sort of thing to, yeah. to slowly coming around about a decade later. Uh, of, of seeing that actually that this really wasn't true and that it yeah. had value. Well, 
it is true if you have the psychopyrus thousand yeah. okay but yeah. if you don't and see and one thing she also discovered that sometimes it didn't have to therefore be a big cathartus you could bring it through mm. on the on the vegetative level you know, mm-hmm. we talk, we have this concept of the emotional vasomotoric cycle. So this charge of an emotion, then there is the top is expression or insight, and then there is the down going, you know, mm-hmm. which includes the psychoperistalsis. Mm-hmm. And so you realize that if you bring it through, you know, if you can release the charge in the body, in the vegetative level, in the psychoperistalsis, then maybe that big, you know, maybe it just needs a, just an insight or just touching on the grief or Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't have to become the big explosion Mm -hmm. sometimes it does but not necessarily yeah because the point is that it gets worked through yeah Yeah, so my my own journey i was just saying with with catharsis coming from a very strong cathartic school at the time you know was i I came to realize that it's definitely a value especially initially for people who, you know, they never used their voice, they never yeah. expressed, they never shouted no when they were little yeah. Yeah. with any real force, and it creates an opening. But but then after that, it's constantly relying upon this kind of, you know, prefrontal cortex dominated egoic mind to go back into this framework of anger, to get a bit of release, to feel good for a while, but it needs to do it again, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was like, like, like somewhere it's like, almost like what you're saying, I think, is that it's not really relying on the body at a more subliminal level. Mm. It's not supporting the body to release. Yeah. It's again, a form of kind of slight tyranny coming yeah. from, the, from yeah. the, the kind of the thinking mind yeah. and to kind of demand the body to release in some way, you know. And, and sometimes a resistance to go soft. Yes, yeah? yes. You all the time stay in this charged yeah. space and 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 because it's not safe enough to to soften yeah um you know again for good reasons yeah but but therefore you don't really integrate you don't really clear yeah um i mean something i certainly saw in in the osho scene was the women get strong i mean the women get really strong you know Yeah. yeah yeah As a guy, normal kind of 80s male coming, 90s male coming from the outside to come into Osho environment, it was like, it was a very powerful matriarchy, you know, and the guys would be typical guys, they'd they'd, they'd go through some kind of process, they'd realise that other men weren't such a threat as you tend to to think out in the world when you came into the Osho environment, and then they kind of they, they can become vaguely feminine. I mean, a lot of them are a bit feminine anyway, mm-hmm. but they kind of, they just chug along and do their jobs and whatever. And, and, and the women kind of, well, they kind of almost went into a male role a lot of the time, but they would get very involved in power hierarchies mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, like who, who, had, who had got the best job, who was over who, who was controlling the work, uh, who had the trophy male that the others wanted, or, or, or whatever, you know, it was kind of this in, in strange inversion. It was kind of exciting as well. But certainly the women became very, very strong and they developed what was called kind of encounter muscles at times where, mm-hmm. where you're so good at defending yourself against yeah. any situation, you know, everyone just keeps well clear. You yeah. Know, really, yeah. You know, and then, yeah. And then that, that, that got discussed and then it got broken open a bit more, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of interesting to see just... Uh, but we've kind of come from this very restricted background in Western culture, most people, and and then there's so much development that has never happened. We've never really. How yeah. many people have lived in a matriarchy? You know, in a, in, in a female female in a female yeah. power hierarchy. You know, very very few people have ever done that. You know, mm. just, uh, well, you can you can imagine maybe why uh, women were uh, subjugated because uh, the, the physical power, mm. uh, the physical is very male. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the testosterone develops more muscular tissue. Yes. Uh, where, so that's how we are born, but the, 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 the feminine has a different kind of strength. And the, um, the, the suppression of that strength uh, is when, when back and so it's interesting to allow people not necessarily to come to be governed by the male or be governed by the, the female, but more to, to find 
in us a balance between our own masculine and feminine. Mm. So we don't need to act out what we were suppressed. Mm. And so, and, and that is um, in an interesting way, how it connects to the psychoperstalsis is because it is about balance. Mm. Yeah. And, and flexibility, it, and mm -hmm, flexibility. Mm -hmm. So you can be all, all parts of the emotional fascinatoric cycle. You can allow the charge, you can express the charge, but you can also soften and settle. And in, yeah. the, in, in our work, we don't, and naturally a person will not go into screaming and screaming over and over yeah. because the charge, their own charge, if we're thinking that we have blood pressure and we, and muscular tension, so we, tighten up in order to express whether it's a physical expression, verbal expression, an insight, uh, uh, emotional expression. But if we naturally, once the charge goes through, we naturally want to come into the relaxation element, into integrating the event, into, so to speak, harvesting from what happened. Mm. So when the therapist is now bringing their own energy and charges back the system, it's artificial. Mm -hmm. And it can become very addictive because if we're thinking mm -hmm. about the whole human for a moment as one cell, so it becomes very addictive to blow up and let go, blow up and let go. And with all the chemistry that happens and in biodynamic, we want to create actually tonus, mm -hmm. the ability to be flexible on all levels so choice is coming back and our autonomic nervous system is connected so much to the unconscious because we cannot consciously govern it that when the psychoperistalsis what Gerda will call when a person has an open psychoperistalsis then they are healthy mm -hmm. meaning that their system on all levels has reached a level of flexibility that it can respond to life events yeah. self-regulation yeah, yeah. that's the next term, which is self-regulation, which yeah. ties to independent well-being, that a person is independently uh, has a sense of wellness, that they don't need for that others. And because of that, they can create meaningful relationships. Mm. And I just want to add about the psychoperstasis that it's not uh, proven medically, mm. but clinically we see it over and over about that when the internal pressure is reduced, I mean, after all, we are more than 70% salt water under pressure, mm -hmm. right? And that when that, when the more stressful we feel, the more uh, we feel that internal pressure. And so when that pressure is reduced, we normally will hear the psychoperistalsis right in the session, or later it can happen too. It's not always immediate. The breath will change and the person will feel uh, a relief. Yeah. Their face will change. It's amazing to see it. And it's noticeable to them. It's like the biodynamic effect, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so that we, we really see a, a physiological uh, change when there is uh, first almost, we could say first almost it comes the body, the psychoperistasis comes in, the parasympathetic um, takes, um, um, becomes dominant. And in stress, it's the, the, the sympathetic, yeah? So there's more pressure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when Colleen said about being humble, it's so very beautiful that it's very easy to, to contract. That happens quickly. Mm. But to unwind, it's, it's a process in a very different time, in a more eternal time. It's more open time. Mm. And with therapists, we, in a way, we can only suggest that through our touch, but we can't induce it, so to speak. It's something that happens from within. Mm. And so it leaves us very, um, very, very humble. Uh, and that's something that I love about the biodynamic work, that 
the truth is in the client even if they don't know it it's in the client and we don't know and we are left in the position of not knowing so um, so elegantly because it protects the client from our unresolved issues as well yeah yeah so we don't guide with our shadow and thinking that we are guiding with some great insight mm-hmm but we're not doing good enough, so we have to make them change. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, it's lovely to chat to you guys. Mm. Thank you, thank you for um, coming mm. on. Is there anything? Um, so, if someone's watching this, say, and they're kind of interested in your work, what would, what, what, what should they do? Do you think? What would you suggest? Well, go to the website. Um, well, the London School of Biodynamic Psychotherapy website, I think it's www.centerofbodypsychotherapy.co.uk. And there should be a lot of information there. And there's a way of contacting the administration. Um, yeah, and come to one of the introductory workshop days. We run open evenings that are free. Um, we have some introductions happening in the next few months. We're hoping to start a new training group in October. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, um, and but that is sort of every year. And we might also start to offer more short courses, taster mm-hmm. courses. Um, and it's beautiful work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Annette and I have been doing it for more than 30 years, 35 years. So yeah. It's still exciting. Mm. Mm. Of course, sometimes therapy is painful. It can be heavy, can be love. But again, that that also, you know, because if you work as a therapist and you work a lot, you take on quite a lot of people's traumas. You know, you you feel it in the energy. You feel it, and to know how to self-regulate, to know how to get your own psychopathic responses going again, is of huge value because. You know, I, I still remember Gerda often seeing her, you know, because she would live in the house um, or, you know, we would be allowed to work in her house or something. You would see her lying on her left side with her crime novels. She loved crime that relaxed her reading crime novels and a stethoscope in her ears. And she would just be busy digesting, clearing the previous session with the client, just coming back to, to her own energy flow. You know, so her charge would have been cleared and then she would go into the next session so completely again available and open Mm -hmm. and um, so I I really value you know that in in our work we we have that tool because um, you know we we can it can be heavy going being a therapist in terms of the trauma and the pain that you come across um, so it's very important to keep processing it through, clearing it out, clearing it through. Um, and there the psychoperistalsis is useful too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what I would like to add is that um, actually you could just type London School of Dynamic Psychotherapy and you're immediately guided on Google or mm-hmm. any other uh, search engine. And that, um, that we... There are three things that we offer. One is a diploma course that, as Carlene mentioned, um, we're aiming to start in October and we are receiving applications right now. So that's one. Um, the other is... UKCP per- registered diploma course. So it gets you to UKCP level. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the other one is a personal therapy and there is a whole... Uh, section there uh, where people can find a therapist, a biodynamic therapist in their area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's another uh, thing that people can do if they're interested in exploring it. Mm -hmm. Um, Later on in the year, we have a low cost student clinic where the students practice under supervision and that will be opening later in the year Mm -hmm. or in the beginning of next year. COVID permitting, yeah. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. And uh, and then we are offering as well short courses from one day 
to more than that. And, um, and so by all means, come to, to, to uh, come to the website, I would say, and then find what you're interested at. There are some videos there as well of uh, uh, different teachers um, that people can actually listen to. Um, and um, we are, um, we're very excited to, to continue our work, um, mm -hmm. especially after this. We continued uh, through the whole uh, COVID um, situation. Um, the school kept on uh, teaching and we moved our teaching online. So we are, uh, and now we are back in person. So we are doing as well some workshops online as well. And um, and uh, this work is really uh, unique. And in the UK, there are only two schools that are offering uh, on body psychotherapy, we could say. Uh, mm -hmm. We are very dedicated to Gerda Boyson's uh, work. And then there is another school that has it integrated in, um, in a larger way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, and so I mean, there are more schools, but in in our in our angle, you know, our corner of the body psychotherapy. Yes, there's us yeah. and this Cambridge. Yeah, and um, yeah. and I would say, if you're curious, that's already good. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Well, it's lovely to. Uh, Thank you for agreeing to come on on, on this uh, podcast and it's great yeah. to meet you. And yeah. uh, I will leave a link anyway in the description below for for the, for the school so people can check that out without a problem. So thank you very much. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to share. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah.